welcome to episode 213 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Friends, if I sound excited, it is because I am excited because this evening, in anticipation of the snowpocalypse, which is coming our way, uh, I've already found out that we have no school tomorrow. And if you have ever been waiting for that sort of call to be made by your district, whether it's for inclement weather or it's, you know, you've got hurricanes in your neighborhood, you know, this is one of those decisions which districts oftentimes wait until the very last minute to let everybody know that we're not going to have school or we are going to have school. Either way, it can become an a huge PR disaster. And I will say not too long ago, not only was I in my car, but I was driving to school when I got the notification that school would be canceled. And very grateful to my friends who actually know that I leave early and they texted me and they're like, no, 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 turn around, turn around. So yeah, I, um, I'm very grateful when we know the night before that indeed we do not have school due to the snow that is coming our way. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Harry in Michigan, Beth in Virginia, and Stacy in Washington, D.C. Longtime listener Laura in Missouri sent an episode request, and I'm going to title it Meltdowns, Tantrums, and Student Safety. And this is a topic which we have touched upon in several previous elementary-focused episodes, but I feel it deserves its own conversation. And I would love if somebody has experience dealing with, you know, very young students in our spaces and how the demands and the the challenges of our spaces create even more challenges for students who are perhaps having a hard time acclimating to the routines of school. And it's just, and unfortunately they're, they're young and it just turns into something absolutely incredibly disruptive. So I know this is an episode that other people would appreciate hearing. So if that person is you, please do make sure to reach out to me soon. I appreciate it. Laura was also kind to mention, quote, thank you again for the podcast. I am serious in saying that I learned so much and it helps me to be a better teacher librarian to my K-5 students. I am grateful to have this professional learning opportunity at my fingertips, end quote. I am so grateful to listeners like Laura who reach out to the podcast with episode suggestions and feedback because it's incredibly helpful. It it gives us purpose. It gives us direction, but it also is incredibly validating. And I want to make sure that, that all the guests who step up and join this effort every single week. And, and I'm talking about these amazing people who join the podcast. They provide us with content and with expertise and resources, which they so generously give of their time and their talents. This feedback's for them as well, because I get to get that fan mail, but I want to push it out to the listeners who have stepped up over the years through all of these amazing seasons that we've shared together because they're the ones who are the reason why this podcast continues. It's because the content that they provide, and I am more than happy to to press record and provide uh, a a ready available audience to to listen to all of this. But thank you so much for giving us that kind of feedback because it's incredibly helpful. Since Laura brought up the topic of professional learning, I wanted to make sure that I extended this opportunity to anybody who's who's tuning in. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions regarding summer professional development opportunities. There are districts each and every summer which have offered continuing education credits to the school librarians in their district for listening and reflecting on episodes of their choosing. I have yet to meet an administrator who has said no to professional development, which is free, customizable, and convenient. Just know the answer is always going to be yes for me. By all means, if you 
uh, if you ever want to talk, just reach out to me. But, but yes, absolutely. If you are looking for opportunities to offer professional development to your team over the summer, the podcast is, is ready and available. And just let me know if you ever want to talk about that. I'm, I'm here. Email me at schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. Friends, I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. And now in a segment I like to call Why I Love Capstone. Friends, I am so excited about the series that I found is brand new in 2023, and it is called Heroic Animals, and it is part of the Capstone Press Graphic Library. These are graphic nonfiction books, and I will go ahead and read from the copy. There are four books in this series. When duty calls, heroes step up. Even if they have wings, flippers, or walk on four legs, discover the courage behind heroic animals that brave dangers of the battlefield, raced across rugged terrain, or made daring rescues. Engaging narrative and dynamic full-cover graphic novel illustrations immerse readers in these incredible true stories of animal heroes. Series feature includes images of each animal hero and additional information for readers to learn more about the lives of these amazing animals. Step into the daring, real-life adventures of these animal heroes. And the titles include Share on Me Comes Through, Heroic Carrier Pigeon of World War I, Moko to the Rescue, Heroic Dolphin of New Zealand, Sergeant Reckless Braves the Battlefield, Heroic Korean War Horse, and Togo Takes the Lead, Heroic Sled Dog, of the Alaska Serum Run. And friends, these are all 2023 titles. And as with other series offered by Capstone, I would strongly recommend when you purchase a series, I think it's a wonderful thing to keep them together, especially because when you look at the cataloging, this would sort of scatter these books throughout your collection. And I could see the value in putting graphic novels interspersed with your nonfiction, but I think the value is in keeping these all together because if you have one uh, book that, that excites the students, the likelihood is they're going to look for the other ones. If you keep a, in your graphic novel section, a narrative nonfiction uh, section as well. It, it really does ensure that these titles are going to be uh, enjoyed by your students. Because, for example, the uh, the different uh, call numbers include 940, 599, 951 and 636. So um, obviously you would have these books sort of scattered throughout your collection. And I think that for the purposes of generating that excitement to read all the books in a series, because you know you have those readers who are like, I want to read all of them. And you're like, yes, I understand that. So definitely consider if you get this series to keep them all together in your graphic novel section so that the students can have, can have easy access to them. I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued Continued commitment to support the podcast in season five. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepop.com and use the code United to get twenty dollars off an order of a hundred dollars or more for both print and Capstone Interactive eBooks. That's code United for twenty dollars off an order of a hundred dollars or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepop.com. And now for our episode, Making All the Mistakes, and my conversation with Jennifer Long. Jennifer Long, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Friends, you're in for a treat. I am so grateful that Jennifer has joined the conversation today. Jennifer, give us some context, would you please? Where in the country do you work? Tell us a little bit about your library and the grades you support and the kind of of teaching schedule you have, because I I really think it'll put a lot into, uh, you know, it'll help our listeners better understand the kind of day you have day in and day out. Sure. 
Um, well, I am in the Piedmont Triad area of North Carolina, so near Greensboro, Winston-Salem. Um, I'm actually just a little bit north in a more rural uh, county, but I'm in an elementary school, and I have a we have pre-K through fifth grade. I'm on a definitely a hybrid schedule. Um, it is <laughs> we are making things work this time around. Um, so I teach um, last semester I taught all the grade levels, but one week I would do K2 and the next week I would do 3-5 um, and I kind of uh, split it with the school counselor. And so this time around, I'm only doing K2 in the mornings and then we've got a maker space. And so I'm kind of using the afternoons for times to have maker space and just meeting with teachers and, and whatnot. So it's um, a little bit. And then to add into that, one week out of the month, the school counselor is taking all of the classes. So then I don't teach at all that week and I have time to like go to teacher's planning and I get to go to the pre-K story time. So it's like I said, it's, it's truly a hybrid, a hybrid model. <laughs> so pause. I'm really curious. I've never heard of a scenario where the, you said the school counselor takes the kids because it's release time for your teachers. So I, I hate to even ask like the, what do the counselors do? Do they have like little little lessons on, you know, social emotional learning? I mean, I I really don't I can't even imagine. I don't know how our well, let me just say this. I've never worked in an elementary school that had counselors in it. <gasps> really? Oh my goodness. Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. I can't even I I can't. I can't process that. Was, <laughs> um no, the counselors have social been- worker a school psychologist. Wow. Yeah. No, I, at the school yeah. that I was at previously, because I, I recently moved to the school I'm at. So I am brand new, like as in November, brand new. Um, and we're recording here in February. So um, I am brand new to this school. Um, I had been at an, um, in an urban, more urban school. Um, and it was something similar, not quite as I, I, I taught much more at that school. Um, but the, still the school counselor came in and did like one class a day. Um, and I, I learned so much just from having both of them in my space. Um, just phenomenal and watching their lessons, watching how they interact with the kids. Uh, yeah, I can't even imagine. I've just um, been very, very lucky to be able to have that. In. Wild. Oh my gosh. No. So learning new things every day. The idea, no, I, I've in, in every school I've ever worked in in Michigan, we've never had a school counselor in the elementary schools. We've had the social worker, we've had the school psychologist, we've had, uh, you know, a speech therapist, we've had, but we've never had anybody come in. Uh, no, absolutely not. That's wild. Okay. So friends, I think it's important uh, that the listening audience appreciate how this episode came about. So Jennifer emailed the podcast and you had an idea. Uh, you even had a title. Um, would you give us an idea of what motivated you to be this candid with our listening audience? Because friends, today, the, the episode, Making All the Mistakes, is something that Jennifer completely conceived of. And I loved the idea. And I, I think you'll realize right away the benefit that this has for anyone doing our jobs and tuning in today. Oh, sure. Well, don't joke around and write to Amy uh, thanking her for the wonderful job that she's doing and saying, hey, if you need somebody who's making all the mistakes, I'm your gal. Um, and <laughs> I say that, but I, I truly I wrote because, uh, Amy, what you do here is just such a valuable it's been such a valuable thing to my my professional life. Um being a school librarian, you can really be by yourself out there. I mean, we've, I, we've all heard that and said that. And you have created this wonderful thing that is allowing us to see inside of other librarians spaces, their, their, their brain spaces, their literal spaces. Um, and you're allowing us to connect and get ideas in ways that we just don't get. So I just, I, I mean, I, I wrote to you because I meant it genuinely. Again, having moved, you know, uh, schools recently, 
I, you know, I went from a school that had over 68 elementary schools. You know, we had a ton of librarians. We had a director. Um, and I'm now at a roller school with, you know, like I think we've got 12 elementary schools. We don't have a, a dedicated library director. I and mean, we would have somebody over librarians, but it, that person's not a librarian. And so it's just I would have really felt a lot more alone had had I not been listening to your podcast and getting ideas. I mean, you've got you've got an episode for everything at this point. So you had, you know, being a librarian in a new space, I could pull that up. <laughs> you know, it was it was wonderful. But I know one of the days I was listening and I listened on my drive. And so I was driving home. I had just had a bad day. And I I was listening, and I'm sure some of, of your other listeners are doing that. You listen to these wonderful people and they are just these glowing experts and you're just astounded at all the work that they're doing. And I, I think I was just sitting there going, what would I ever be an expert in? And I was like that day, I'm like, oh, I'd be an expert on making all the mistakes. How is it I'm in this profession this long and I'm still making mistakes? And so I kind of jokingly you know, thought about that. But then it made me think, you know, and that is how we learn. Um, so so today I am the like nailed it version of <laughs> If you've ever seen that on Netflix, you know, where people try to make the the cake that is kind of like, you know, the expert baker, you know, um, and then you see the comparison that that is, that is what I'm doing. But um, I, you know, I also think I read it in another cooking reference, but um, there is a cookbook that I read one time uh, called Mastering My Mistakes in the Kitchen um, and it is by the food and wine editor in chief. And she wrote this cookbook just basically saying, you know, look, I'm surrounded by, you know, master chefs and I go to cook, you know, some of the same things and I am just making mistakes. And she, she wrote this whole cookbook um, where she just talks about her mistakes and how she goes to, you know, these experts to find out what did I do wrong and how, you know, what what can I do to fix this? So um, so there there is all the. The, the why behind <laughs> the idea of this episode. And friends, I think it's obvious why this is such an important conversation to be having and more importantly to be sharing. Because I think that if we were, you know, if we were third grade teachers, we would have a third grade team. If we were fifth grade teachers, if we if we were part of the math department at the middle school or, at, you know, ELA at the high school, we'd have 10, 15 people we could sit down and just commiserate with. And those who had like been there, done that, got the t-shirt, talk about the things that they did when they were our you know, starting off in, in, you know, fill in the blank. And the fact is we can't do that. Uh, you are the first librarian I've talked to all day. And, um, that, that's going to be my, that I'll be honest, friends, when I interview, yeah, when I interview people at night there, that is the first librarian I've talked to all day because, and the person who understands best some of my frustrations, because we, in what we do and the fact that there are so few of us, in order to have that, that conversation be received with the same kind of, of empathy and that it, it needs and that receiving audience to, to internalize that. When, when I started to look at all of the great ideas that Jennifer was putting down for us to discuss, I'm thinking of the, the third person in that conversation and that is the listener. And so while Jennifer and I are going through talking about this, it's very cathartic, but it's also important to recognize that you as the listener can be having your own sort of self-reflection exercise. And if you're a journal, if you like to write in your journal, you can reflect on this. If you like to sort of make lists and you can start making lists and chip away at some of these things. But but appreciating the mistakes that we have not only experienced, but then come to reflect on and learn from them. That to me is such a valuable experience. And it, I don't think, I think it's really quite helpful because when you look at your, your own journey, you know, there's so much that, that we can learn from. to make fun of Jennifer just for a minute because she categorized. She, she put all of her, her mistakes in categories. We have, and friends, if you want to pause the, the, the podcast episode right now, because you can start creating your own little uh, lists, but the categories for today are mistakes I didn't know what I was making at the time. The next category is mistakes where I know better, but I keep making them. Another category is mistakes I made when I really should have heeded advice given by others. 
Uh, another category, mistakes other people think I make, but I'll keep making them. I also have mistakes that come with the job. Hello. <laughs> All of us are nodding our heads now. Mistakes because of my nature. And then lastly, mistakes I haven't made. So friends, I mean, if you could, you know, what great sort of like journaling topics you could have right there. If you wanted to pause the, the podcast, come back when you've created your own list so we can all pour some wine, have a good cry, realize that we have grown from the mistakes that we make. And um, truly, I, I'm so grateful you're here for the ride. So, so Jennifer, let's go ahead. We're going to start off with mistakes I didn't know I was making at the time. Well, being a new librarian, um, when I, I so I've been a librarian now officially for four years. Um, I, I I went through UNCG. I'll give a shout out to my alum <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Heather Morfield Lang was one of my professors, so she's in one of the previous episodes. Um, please check her out. So I book processing. I'm just going to start there. I just can't seem to get book processing correct when you make a book order. I, I think I'm getting the spine labels down correctly and they show up and now suddenly I have I, I've not conveyed what I wanted in, in the spine labels. Um, I also made the mistake um, of wanting to do too many categories. Like I wanted to have an ER section and I wanted them to label that on the spine label rather than just doing stickers after the fact. Um, I did that with a beginning chapter book and they just, they, they are not, they don't process, they don't handle. I, I didn't have success with that. And I used two different companies. I didn't, most recently, I didn't realize being at a new school, I, I, again, I thought I had this right, but I didn't realize there was a separate ask for the plastic book jacket covers. I had never asked for that at my previous. I guess that was just something that was automatically already in there and I didn't know to ask for it. So I, I got my book order and all of no, no plastic book jackets. So can I just throw in there? Because I'll be honest. Um, I will tell you when it comes to Mark records, my first job, I completely generated all of my, I created all of my records. I, I would buy from Follett and I was, I wasn't aware that I could upload Mark records. So I would actually create a record using the Follett feature there because I remember somebody in my, my team said, Oh, look, you can add your own books really easily. But nobody sat me down and said, and here's how you do Mark records because as a brand new librarian, I, I didn't know that that was a step. And I am not kidding you. I went for years just creating my own records on Follette and not importing Mark records again, like you said, because I didn't ask or I didn't know I had to ask. Like you don't, okay, this is dumb. You don't know what you don't know till you don't know it. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And that book processing has gotten me <laughs> multiple times. Every time I think I know, I, I, don't, I, I there's something new that I'm, I'm like, oh, <laughs> You know, you said that you you got something wrong on your specifications for your book processing. And because I was so sure I was going to get it wrong, I just didn't have any book processing. And oh, wow. that is, I, I think what you really have to learn from that is like, call up a representative and just, just put yourself out there and be vulnerable and say, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. Please talk me through this process because when you make a mistake in book processing, it is either a colossal waste of time or it's a colossal waste of money. Right. Or it's yes. both. Yes. I completely agree. Yes. And another way I've wasted time is because when you get those books that aren't really, I, I, they didn't have a mark, right? You know, it's a book that somebody's donated or it's, it's, um, you know, it, just one that you, you're, you don't have the mark record for and you're adding it. I can't tell you how much time I have wasted when I can't find the call number that it should be. And I'm not sure what it is. And so I'm literally going to public libraries, trying to search for this book to find out what their call number that they were using or other libraries were using, um, and, and I completely forgot about the OCL, OCLC website that I'm sure I learned about in my cataloging class at, you know, but I had just forgotten about it. 
um, until I think, you know, I stumbled upon it and I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh yes. I remember now. <laughs> well, and, and again, you know, we work, there's our, our time is so precious because the time that we have to focus on things and not be interrupted because you know, processing books is one of those tasks, which if you are constantly getting interrupted, this is going to take so much time to actually complete. So you're right. And, you know, when we're trying to be selfish with our time, we tend to make compromises. And and I see where this, this could easily become an issue, especially if you don't have somebody over your shoulder going, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So, you know, I, I appreciate that. Again, I think we've all been there on some level, because the first time you sit there and you have to process books, you just are sure right, you're doing it wrong. Right. Yes. So yes, those good mentor programs, I think probably <laughs> adding that to the mentor programs. Friends, I'm convinced that when you are a pre-service school librarian, you're still in library school and you're going out there and you're working in, you're going to get some experience in either an elementary or a middle school or a high school. There ought to be like this checklist of things that you absolutely should learn um, while you're here learning from this, this librarian that you're learning from, including how to repair books, including how to download mark records, including how to, you know, process books. And it's, it's so many different things that really are very specific to different times in the year. So I can see where it doesn't always come up. But these are experiences that, unfortunately, if we don't have them when we're pre-service school librarians, then we're just going to be experiencing them on our on our own. Right. And especially because, you know, if you're in a pre-service, they're not going to teach you these specifics because, you know, they don't know if you're going to be going to a public library and what system you're going to be using. So it really is specific once you get the job and then there you are by yourself, <laughs> unless you, <laughs> you know, are lucky to have a para there um, who maybe has done it before um, or something like that. Now, you did mention here uh, something about your principal's calendar, and I'm dying to know what, what this mistake was. Okay, so I've got this brand new makerspace, which is it is wonderful. I, I I really just walked into, I won the lottery getting this job of, of walking into a space where I have a principal who over the summer built the makerspace um, with, and, and, and I mean, it was truly his vision. Um, so he's, he's all in, all in on this. Um, but he was, so I knew this next semester I wanted to create a sign up, you know, for the makerspace and he had sent out his observation schedule, like where you sign up for your observations. And I was like, oh, he's got great times on this. I'm just going to copy this and use this as a template for my makerspace sign up. So I copied it. Didn't close the other window. There's the mistake. You close the window of the item that you've copied. I did not and mistakenly started creating in my whole new makerspace on his observation where I deleted everybody's. <laughs> um, luckily, he typed me a little message that said, he caught me doing it and said, I think you're on the wrong document. And I control Z. Control Z is our, our friend and undid all the things that I had done and hopefully got back to the exact spot and didn't undo somebody who had signed up. I think what we do realize and what does sort of paralyze us is this idea that when we make mistakes, it can resonate on a school level. When we do something, it is going to impact uh, oftentimes, you know, that ripple effect when we do something has its effect across the entire school. So if we decide to do something and then it has to be sort of retroactive or it has to, you know, you have to take it back, it really is a, a mea culpa to the entire building. You're like, oh, my bad. We, we do sort of, on, on the one hand, we have this wonderful opportunity to impact our buildings. On the other hand, when we make a mistake, it's not unusual for it to be a very public mistake. Right. Yes. Yes. Very true. You mentioned also one of the mistakes that you made was was not sufficiently communicating with the staff. And I can see, I think everybody realizes there is a balance when it comes to communicating with our staff. But you want to talk about that? Sure. Well, one of them is morning checkout. So 
I went ahead, you know, I've got morning checkout set up. I think it was something that was there, but I, I basically said, you know, come let the kids come just a couple at a time, you know, and uh, you know, they can come. I, I didn't set the expectation for how long they were going to be there in the mornings. You know, I just kind of assumed that they would come and get their books and be on their way. But of course, you know, I know better. You've got kids who are going to hang. They, they love our spaces. That's how I take it. They love our spaces. Then I'm having you know, teachers call, you know, is so-and-so in the, in the, in the space. And so um, that was a lack of communication, both to the teachers and to the students when they got there. So my new brilliant way of, uh, <laughs> of fixing this is now when the kids come in, I have colored shelf markers that you can get from Demco. And so when the kids come in, they all have to get a shelf marker to come through. So I put all the yellow ones out and I write down what time it is that that I've given out the yellow ones. And when the yellow ones are done, I actually have library minions, then the red ones, and I write down the time. So, you know, 10 minutes past, I can just make a nice announcement. If you've got a yellow shelf marker, your time is up. You need to come to the checkout counter. You know, it's kind of, so that, that was a, a solution, but it was because I didn't set that expectation with the students and I didn't communicate with the staff. And so that's, at, at least that's been kind of, solved, but I didn't know I was making that mistake in the moment. <laughs> but I, I love that solution. It's elegant. It's, it's very important that our students, if you encourage them to use a shelf marker, that's a, a good way to make sure your, your shelves don't get trashed. And you've already created this, this sort of, you know, you, a staggering system where you can tell what time kids arrived based on what color their shelf marker is. So in many cases, you know, Librarians already have these in their libraries. This is a quick and easy solution. And appreciating that we we can change what we're doing if it means we're going to get better at what we're doing. I one of the things I've I've I have learned that my mistakes benefit a lot of these new hires that are coming in because in my situation, I'm I started teaching 30 years ago. And when I talk to our new hires, these new hires are the age of my children, my adult children. They're 23, 24, 25. And all of a sudden, I one of the things I've said to them so often is, if something isn't working, you can change it. Like you don't, you don't need permission to just wait until the next school year starts to, to fix a, a situation. You have an opportunity now to just say, you know what? I got a better solution. Here we go. You guys are yellows. And in 15 minutes, oh, those kids are going to be red. And in 15 minutes, those kids are going to be blue. There we go. Problem solved. Right, right. So that worked. <laughs> so let's talk about mistakes where I know better, but I keep on making those those mistakes. Yes. So these are the ones that, that hurt the most, I think, <laughs> because you just see yourself doing them. One of them in this, I, I really got out of my UNCG, we had a leadership class. And just one of the key pieces that I took away from it was that you really need to put people first. And, and especially as a librarian, there is always going to be shelving. There's always going to be processing. There's always going to be something that we need to be doing. But the people for me have to come first and it's about those relationships. And so, but we always have these other things. <laughs> They're always there just stacking up and we are interrupted frequently in our, our, in our job. And so sometimes I, I want to finish the task and I don't always give, you know, a kid comes in and I'm, I'm shelving either the books and the kid comes in and I, I'm only halfway listening to what they're saying. And I, I catch myself doing that. And I'm like, no, I've got to stop and be present with the kid and give them my full attention. And, and you know, that they are the reason that we uh, I'm there. That's just one of those mistakes that, you know, the same thing with our teachers or, you know, all of it. Just putting those people first and, and letting the other things pause while they can. They're things. They're not people. <laughs> so, Jennifer, can I just say, Martha Bongiorno, who was last week's guest, she's amazing. She shared something on Canvas, and I'm going to ask her if I can if I can share it as well. And it's a sign that she generated, and um, it says, please interrupt me. 
And it lists all the different things that she's doing. But it again, it, it it's a message to the people who walk in the door and say, please interrupt me. This is, you are more important. What I'm doing right now is never as important as, as taking care of, of, of the people who come in. And, and I'm going to ask her if she wouldn't mind sharing that template because it is a fantastic invitation for the people who come through our doors to say, I could use some help, Jennifer, uh, you know, and, when you put that invitation on the door, you put it at your circ desk, it also reminds us that we truly are there to support the people. I Today, I, I felt like my single job was to somehow manage 15 Chromebook carts. But at the end of the day, the real important thing was I was supporting my 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 students, my staff. We're, we just finished up exams today. And there were a lot of things that had to happen because it was the last day of, of exams. But in the back of my head, those Chromebook carts aren't going to fix themselves. So, you know, I, I, I can, I, I don't think you're alone when you say, you know, this is something that we can easily get bogged down with the stuff. No, I, it is a balancing act. It truly, truly is. I have the priority. It's just remembering it sometimes and putting it to, putting it to use. Well, and I think it's fair to say that there are certain jobs that we only do when we can commit that kind of bandwidth and we have that kind of time. I know that when our, you know, I think we had the third grade go out on a field trip. So all of a sudden my third grade classes weren't in school that day. And so I said, Oh, well I can do X because I know. (laughs) And, and I think another thing that I'll be honest, a, a mistake I made often in my first five years of being a school librarian is when a damaged book came to me, I wanted to fix it in front of the student so they could check that book out. I wanted to fix that book the instant it came in, as opposed to like creating a book hospital and, and saying, look, you know, I'm very sorry. This book needs help and I'm going to, I'm going to repair it, but now is not the time. And you can have this book when it gets repaired. But right now I'm going to ask you to pick something else out because if I try and have you ever (laughs) tried to repair a book on the spot I'm going to tell you right now, it is going to backfire spectacularly. Be okay with creating a book hospital and create a, a little, a little cubby. Uh, and, and that's where all your damaged books go. And then when you have that afternoon when everybody's at assembly or you have that afternoon when all of a sudden you've got something else that, that has taken the children away, you can sit there and go, I'm going to fix all these books. And you get into your mode, you get into your rhythm. And, uh, that was, that was a big mistake for me. I was like, no, I can repair this right now. And then I would glue the inside. I'd put a rubber band around the book and I'd say, okay, this is your book. But you can't open it till you get home because that glue's got to dry. And I am not kidding you. The kid looked at me like, okay, I'm not going to open this book until the glue is dry. And it's like, yep, that was me just making my mistakes. No, that's, I mean, and you know, the, the day that you teach the young kids about, you know, not taking care of the books and, you know, not ripping them they will find every little tear and bring it up to you that day that they check out books because they will flip through it and they will see every little, little tear. And then suddenly you've got, you know, <laughs> all the, all the book hospitals. Going oh to be my God. That day. Yeah. That's right. And, and I mean, but it is, I mean, again, you have to be careful for what you wish for. When you tell the kids, I need your help finding the damaged books. Right. <laughs> and you're right. It could, it, I mean, we're talking about the tiniest little tear and a little dog ear. And you're like, oh, go fix it. You just flip the dog ear up. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> gets very personal. You know, you said one of the mistakes that you make is that uh, you you tend to focus on the negative. And I think that just makes you human. Yes, but especially in when you're teaching. And and I I learned this from God bless my kids preschool teacher. She was absolute hands down the best. She was like Mary Poppins. She was just wonderful. But she told me she followed a a book called Conscious Discipline. uh, And one of the things in there said, what you focus on, you get more of. And I found that to be absolutely true. So when you, you know, when I'm sitting in, you know, reading a story to the kids, 
I, you know, everybody's paying attention and you've got the one kid who's not sitting crisscross applesauce, who's wiggling all around. And when you put your focus on that kid, you focusing on the negative thing. And now I'm going to get more of the negative because that's where I've put my focus. Everybody sees that that's what's getting my attention. And it's like, I know this, I, this has been internal. My kids are like 15 and, and 18. So, you know, they are long since preschool. I know this. And yet I sit there and watch myself doing it. And I have to, you know, I have to wheel back, say, okay, nope, 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 nope. I, not that you, you, you know, you, there's just things you can ignore that at the end of the day are not gonna, you know, or you can do it in such a way that doesn't draw the attention to that. And or just focusing on the kids who are doing the right thing. Because when you do that, you know, that, that's when you're gonna get more of that as well. That's just one that I, I feel like I, I keep, I know better, I keep repeating it. Though. First of all, when it comes to story time, it is so easy to find yourself being distracted by that one person. And, and if this is the case, and you haven't listened to episode 175, Amanda McCoy's Story Time Strategies, she is phenomenal. And I'll tell you what, that is a Story Time Strategies, episode 175, fantastic. And there are so many different resources in the show notes. But, you know, it is one of those things that you really have to, you know, being effective in storytelling and reading those stories and realizing that they're just a bunch of little squirrels that are just, you know, get, they're very, <laughs> and, 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 Please, I think the hardest month is that first month when you're trying to do story time and you just feel like such a failure. And, and, but I'll tell you what, by the time you get to April and May, those kids, they'll get your routines down. They'll, they'll, they'll get those story time behaviors down. But it is, there is nothing easy about trying to do something like engage your, all of your readers when you're, when you're doing a, a story time. So I, I, I totally understand. Forgive me because. I, I will always promote episodes where I think there's a solution, but but we do focus a lot on on elementary because there's so much classroom management involved, and and for so many people, this is the first time they're teaching little the littles, <laughs> and and it really there is an art to to teaching children that young, you know. Let's focus right now on the mistakes I made when I really should have listened to the advice given by others. Because I think, you know, we're always going to be giving advice, but in the moment, it's really hard. So, you know, this first one, I'll admit to as well. <laughs> well, and that is waiting too long to get involved with my state and local library associations. And in North Carolina, we have a great, we have N, uh, NC SLAMA is what we call it, North Carolina School of Library Media Association. And... You know, they have these uh, brew crews. Um, they have some of them in the mornings on Saturday, some of them Friday evenings. And it's just kind of an informal Zoom or Google Meet. And you just, you know, you get to chit chat. And, and I, you know, I, I not, have not done enough of these, but it was what a great opportunity. Um, you know, I, I have been a librarian for a little while now. So, you know, I know how the process of weeding, but I was just in this place where I was kind of stuck with, you know, I, you know, I had a, a, a series of books, you know, and, and I knew if I got rid of, you know, they were old, they, they met the, the, you know, the crew method, you know, they met the, the criteria for getting rid of, but I knew that I wouldn't have anything to replace it with immediately. And I was like, do I get, you know, I would, you know, we all have those times where you're just not, if you only had somebody else to just get an opinion of. Um, and that was a great place. And it was just, it's it just so happened that Christy Sartan and uh, Katie Moose, I think were the two people who had just presented at the conference about weeding. And so they shared their presentation. They were, you know, they just gave me the mindset of, you know, look, if, if you have full shelves, how can you justify the need to, order more books. You know, anybody who sees your shelves are going to say, well, you've got enough books. You don't need, you know, it, it just put a mindset in, in for me that, okay, now I know what I needed to do. And it was just, it was very helpful. 
I wish I had joined that group sooner. And I certainly, you know, got the emails, <laughs> you know, the inviting me. Couple things. First of all, if any of you have ever gone back to season one, there is an episode called There's a Substitute in the Library. What could possibly go wrong? Or something like that. And the reason why I never went to a state a conference in the first five years I was a school librarian. And this is, again, I like you, I, I share, I for me, this is a big regret. But the idea of writing lesson plans and leaving a sub in the library had such just special just backfired spectacularly. My whole episode on there's a sub in the library. Those are all painful experiences where the cleanup of having a sub in the library took months. It wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it to not be in the library. It was just easier for me to come to work every day, never take a day off. Uh, and I'm, this is terrible. I hired my brother to be our Manny to my sick children. So I'd go to work and he'd take the kids in for like their ear infections and pink eye because the last thing I wanted to do was have a sub in the library because every time there's a sub in the library, something terrible goes wrong. And if you ever want to listen to that episode, I'll put a link in the show notes. But that's one big thing is that it was just too hard to take that time off. And yet, it's what I needed. I needed to get out. Uh, another thing, and I'll say, and by the time this episode airs, um, is the idea of bringing somebody else in to help you if you are, if you are weeding. In this case, in Michigan, we have retired school librarians. They're called MAME Forever. And these are retired school librarians who will come in. All they ask is that you provide lunch and they will help you with things like weeding. Because as retired school librarians, this is not hard. And they come at this with such obje objectivity and experience that they're going to remove that emotional component and make this a lot easier. So, you know, I, I think that all the things I'm trying to say that everything you you've experienced makes so much sense. And, and like you, I really struggled with that as well. But yeah, bringing in another set of eyes to weed or, and here's another trick, just pull those non circ stats, you know, print out the books that haven't circulated in eight years. Guess what? They're not going to, they're not going to circulate. Take them off the shelf. And if it helps, don't take them off the shelf until your new books are ready to come in because then nobody notices. And, and it can be something of a rather sort of, uh, you know, just clandestine. All you're doing is as the old books are coming off, just put the new ones on. Nobody notices. <laughs> Yes, because yes, you do have those people or what are you going to do with the books, you know, and, and it just easily avoids that. If you wouldn't mind being afraid to share, and I, I would, I'm hoping you can speak to that because I think as professionals, sharing is one of the ways we learn from one another. Yes, <laughs> I agree. It's still not easy <laughs> when you are super nervous as I am. I mean, even doing this is a huge deal. I have been very afraid to share. And I, I mean, I've, I've been in education for 25 years. So it's not, although I'm new to being a librarian, newish, it's still sharing is, uh, is hard because you are being vulnerable. You're putting yourself out there. Um, but like you said, it, it is how people learn. And even if I, you know, even if people don't take the things that you are sharing, at, you know, at the face value of what you give them, they may be adapting them. Um, they may be hearing something and totally creating something new based on the thing that you did. And so I guess I, I don't know what it was that made me probably, I think, renewing my national board always forced me to have to share. You know, I always felt like I had to, you know, I, I've got to prove what I'm what I've been doing. I, I'm glad that I started to do a lot more of that once I became a librarian, because you are in a position where you can share a lot more Um because you've got a whole staff and, uh, you know, I, we had, you know, during COVID um, in the county that I was in, you know, we had a Teams chat and that was just such a valuable space 
to be able to, you know, throw ideas out there. And, you know, especially with all the technology, how are you solving this problem? And, oh, here, I created this if you need that. Um, so I think that just forced it and made it a little bit easier. And, you know, because of that, like I had, I had been doing some stuff with Padlets. Other, t- other people had not done that. So another librarian and I worked to create a little mini presentation. You know, it just it led to one thing to another. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think being OK and, and letting yourself be vulnerable uh, is good for you. It's good for the growth for you. I, I certainly doing all of this mistake stuff has <laughs> has made me reflect, um, and it's it's good for other people to hear um, and see what you're doing. And I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic because that was the great equalizer. You know, the pandemic really brought everybody down to a, we're all starting now as new teachers again. And I heard this repeatedly in, in, you know, early 2020, because those of us who had been educators for, you know, an entire career, all of a sudden were floundering and feeling like new teachers all over again. And I, and I think when we make that transition from being a classroom teacher to being a librarian, we are being vulnerable again because we left a practice that we were fairly confident and skilled. And you said you were national board certified. My gosh, you were, you were already well-established as, as a, you know, highly effective educator, national board. That's incredible. And then you go into being a school librarian and you start off being brand new again. Yes. Yes. And it's a whole new, (laughs) a whole new level of learning and, and, uh, Yeah. So uh, as you can see, this is why the mistakes episode is is (laughs) the thing that I'm the expert at. (laughs) (laughs) But again, we've got, you know, listeners who are having their own dialogue and these listeners who are reflecting on their own learned experience and their own journey and realizing when you make mistakes then we're that much further away from the starting line. You know, we're, we're making progress and, and it's okay to, to recognize when we made those mistakes because we're not making them anymore. <laughs> you know, let's, let's talk about the, the mistakes other people think I made, but I'll keep on making them because this is, this is clever. And I'm telling you, I, I'm guilty of this myself. Sure. Well, I, I know I've had other librarians who have said, you know, don't spend the time to put all the books in the exact order, not in an elementary school, put the A's together and call it a day. Um, I, 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 I still shelf in the exact order, like the Dewey, it's, 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 they are in the exact order. And I just, because I want to teach my kids where things are, although I will say your episodes with Ben Court and Shelley Cap, Capiller, Capiller, have made me rethinking things, but um, I'm still, no matter what, what, you know, what I decide as is the order, I will still put them in that order, you know? Um, So that's one of the mistakes that I know other people are like, don't, that's, that's not your time, but um, I don't know. It it is for me. Well, and I will, I will admit a cheat that I came up with because at the time when I was in elementary, I did have assistants and they knew where the cat shelf was. So they'd put the cat books on the cat shelf. It wasn't in any particular order, but the, you know, their books they'd put on the far right hand. And if I had a chance, was it actually interfiled correctly? Absolutely not. <laughs> but, but we were in the general vicinity. Right. And I, I will say, cause we do have tubs. Um, so, and I do have little library minions who, you know, my student helpers who, who do come and, you know, um, but I still, I'm trying to get things, you know, like the poetry section, you know, it is in alphabetical order, um, you know, and I try my best. And, and again, that's just something that, that it, that works for me. Cause I want to be able to, I want the kids to be able to find what they're looking for. Um, but you know, again, that's, that's just me. I know another one that um, I think other people are, 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 think is a mistake, but I will continue to do is just jumping into the tech stuff. I am not afraid to let the kids be guinea pigs and let them teach me. I guess I know going in that there is going to be mistakes and I don't know why I'm okay with that for that. <laughs> you know, where I, you know, most of the time I'm trying to avoid them. 
but you know, I've just, I've, I, I think, you know, it's kind of like improv, I guess hey, I've got a theater background. And so it's a little bit like improv when you, you know, sometimes when you're teaching and, uh, I think with the technology, I've, I've just grown so much with letting the kids and technology, um, let's just learn this together. So that's kind of what we did with Minecraft. Um, and boy, did I have, there were just some fabulous lessons in Minecraft. Um, and I, I couldn't have replicated them. I mean, I, I get, I get seasick, like <laughs> watching them go and doing some of the things that they're doing, um, there. Uh, but they, you know, they created some of the most amazing things that, if I had waited till I was comfortable with it, never would have happened. That, that's a mistake I'll keep making is uh, being willing to, to uh, you know, allow it to be messy with the tech. I'm going to chime in because this is something that when I was at ISTE 19, I got to meet Tracy Chun and Tracy Chun wrote an article and I'm hoping that I can uh, attach it. I've attached it before in our show notes, but this idea of brave before perfect, that we shouldn't expect to be perfect before we shouldn't wait until we have everything locked down to then jump into uh, whatever it is, you know, fill in the blank. For you, it's your makerspace and technology. For me, it's teaching research skills. Like I want to have every conceivable research, you know, snag worked out before I teach that lesson. But I'll, I'll use this podcast as an example. Season one, that is hardly perfect. Season one was me just being brave and jumping into it and being like, you know what? You're right. I should just do this. And it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. And I'm only, and you, you're going to get to learn along with me, but you're right. We, we can't just let perfection be the enemy of the good. We have to just make we have to realize that students are learning and we may very well be learning right along with them. Another one is, I will say, going the extra mile for teachers. I only say that that's something that I think other people may not, uh, may see as a, a mistake, only because I've had teachers tell me that, you know, they've never had a librarian who just, you know, kept problems, problem solving for them and didn't give up um, and just going that extra mile. And I think that is, if that's a mistake, I'm going to keep making it because again, it kind of goes down to that relationship piece. And it's, it's it, to me, it's a core piece of our job. And if we just say, oh, I don't know, um, sorry, you know, and, and I, I will keep at it and keep trying to, you know, get the book from the public library if we don't have it, you know, for that teacher or, you know, calling somebody else for something that we need. Um, because, you know, we, we are a curator of that whole space and the people are part of that. And so I think we need to care for that, um, the people in our spaces as well. I'm sure your teachers love you for it too. You know, let's talk about the mistakes that come with the job because we teach in the most unusual of classrooms. It's enormous. It's the school's classroom. And, you know, but everything we do is on such a large scale. But what are some things that you have found have been mistakes you've made just because you're a librarian and not a classroom teacher? I think a, a one that I've learned, a mistake that I made recently was just underestimating the power of administration. You know, when you are a classroom teacher, you can kind of close your door and do your thing. And, you know, while administration is always going to be a part of your job, you are not as, it is not such an integral relationship as it is when you are a school librarian. And so if you get a new, a new, you know, administration, I made the mistake of just assuming that things were going to continue the way that they had been. You know, we, you know, I've established this is how things are. And, and I was very naive and, <laughs> you know, I think it is important to realize that, you know, you need to have that good working relationship. And, it's not always going to be the same. Each administrator is going to come in. And, you know, it, when you can find the administrator who's on the same page and, you know, and really backs you, I, you know, I was listening to Martha um, Bongiorno's episode, you know, about and just, you know, how how <laughs> lucky she is to, have, to be respected. I feel like I'm in that space now as well. 
um, you know, when I've got an administrator who trusts me, who says, you know, this is what we need to, we need to spend this for the makerspace, you know, go at it. That's, that's really important. And I, I had underestimated and just didn't see that piece of it um, initially. So. When I taught in the classroom, uh, the, uh, my principal was simply my evaluator. And for me, the only time I saw my principal was when they came in to do their observations. And beyond that, it, there was zero impact on what I did day in and day out, who the principal happened to be. And as a librarian, it can completely change the dynamic in your space, depending on the relationship and the understanding your li- your uh, administrator has with your space and the expectations that they have with your space. So I think you're right that we can't assume anything. And what I hear from you is this appreciation and awareness that only comes with being in education for a while, because you have that perspective. You can appreciate how the attitudes of our administration directly will impact our space and what we can and can't do. Right. And the role, I mean, that's another unique thing for librarians is we, we have so many different roles. I mean, you look at the librarian and the the librarian that I am is going to be different than the librarian in the school that's, you know, just down the road from, I mean, we all have different responsibilities, different, um, you know, pieces that we, different roles that we play within a school and that a lot of that is based on administration and what role they see us serving. Are we the media specialist? Are we a, you know, and we're just there to, you know, give the teacher their planning time and and we're really, that is our piece of it and we're checking out books or are we like an instructional coach and and we're somebody who's going to collaborate with teachers? You know, those are different visions and, um, you know, the principal and administration, you know, that, that what their vision of it is will directly impact um, and change the nature of our job or can change the nature of our job. Absolutely. I love this, this next idea of, and specifically when it comes to moving schools, because you did move in the middle of a school year, you know, I, I think you've, You've made some some important realizations in the last couple months when it comes to moving to a new school district. When you move school districts, which I do not recommend doing in the middle of a year, that was uh, you get too many email addresses. You when you move districts, you will lose your old email addresses, your old email address and any login, any any program that you were using that was attached to that email address. Um, So, you know, I had had a YouTube playlist, you know, with all these book trailers and I had a, you know, playlist for each grade level because I would do, you know, book trailers at the beginning of class um, while kids were checking in their books. Um, You know, I had Prezi's, all of these things, you know, that I, some of them I just lost because, suddenly my email was gone and I couldn't log into them anymore. So yeah, that was, that was a, there was a learning (laughs) mistake is not switching out and sharing all of the things that I had into just giving myself grace. Um, And there is a lot in moving, you know, whenever you're moving and I I know you've moved schools as well, but um, moving districts, you know, you've, you know, even, you know, just at your insurance changes. I mean, I was at the dentist the other day and you know, I went to, you know, at the end to pay and, and she's like, so should I file this for in your insurance? And I'm like, oh, yeah. And she, and I was like, oh, wait, I have new insurance. I couldn't even remember the name of my new insurance. <laughs> I could not even I, I just blanked out what was the name. I couldn't tell you. So uh, just trying to give myself grace that, you know, it's a lot to move. Well, and Jennifer, can I just say when I moved, because I, I switched districts uh, two years ago, and, and I remember hearing from some people who in in them learning that I was leaving the district, their first response was, I'm not willing to learn everything again. It was, I'm not willing to be new all over again. Oh my goodness, you'd have to switch. You Now, oh my gosh, you're switching districts. Now you have to learn everybody's names all over again. Now you have to, and I was like, yeah, but you also do this because you know it's right for you. But it, you, there is a certain sort of learning curve that's, you know, 
incredibly steep. These things you only have to figure out once when you go into a new district and you never have to learn them again. A lot of your routines are upset when you change your districts. And those routines, you don't realize how routine they are until they're not there anymore. And so it, it does really, it's very disruptive. And yet appreciating that whenever we switch districts, we do so with, with a reason, with a purpose. And we're doing that because it, at the end of the day, it is what we need to, to happen. You know, let's, let's talk about, and this is where I think many librarians are going to identify with you. Let's talk about some of the things you do just because of who you are and that's your nature. Yes. I try to do too many things at once. Uh, everything all at once. <laughs> so I, coming to the new school, there's lots of new, th lots of things to be done. So I'm trying to weed and genreify and do make the maker space. And we have a Spanish immersion program. So we're doing book orders for new um, books in Spanish. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've heard you say it. This should probably be on the advice that I should heed from others. You know, take one thing at a time. Um, but my nature is to just have a lot of pots going. Um, I don't know if it's just because I, I get bored easily and then I can go from one little thing to another little thing. <laughs> I don't know, but it can become overwhelming. So uh, that's one that I, I do need to kind of watch. <laughs> Well, and you know, I, I, that, that whole adage, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and our libraries weren't either. The libraries that we have were not built in a day. And I make very, I am especially careful when I interview librarians who are incredibly successful. Many of them have had the stability of being in one library for decades. And as a result, there are so many things that they have been able to build on and build on and build on, whereas some of us have had to start over. And when you start over, there is that year where you're just trying to get your footing. And, and so I, again, this expectation, especially when, uh, when I interview school librarians who are recognized and they're receiving these state awards for all these incredible things they do, uh, it generally is not in the first year they've moved into that building. <laughs> there are rare exceptions, but for the most part, when we feature school librarians for their outstanding programs, those happened over a series of years and they have been at that school for a long time. No, that's, uh, and, and to their credit, they've, they've done that. You do mention, um, forgetting your students' names. Okay. I am terrible at names, terrible at names. And I, I don't think I'll ever be good at them, but you know, I, I think that students see past that when students see the, the the sincerity and this this authentic joy that you express when they come into your space, the fact that you can't remember their first name does not matter. <laughs> well, I hope so, because <laughs> I do try. I, I, I do try, but it's just, I try to tell the kids when they're leaving as, you know, whatever the fifth grade, or I, I used to teach middle school, so eighth grade, I always told them, when you see me in the store, just tell me who you are. It's not that I, I forget you. It's just the name. I could tell you what book you wanted. <laughs> like I could tell you what genre you liked, but my brain just doesn't do the names. No, for some no. Reason. And that's okay. If some other librarian that you interview has some trick about names, like learning names, I would love to hear it. Yeah. It, it, the, again, seating charts with pictures was always a crutch for me. Um, I recognize their faces. Uh, and you know what? Again, if you show excitement when they, you see them, that, that is going to come through. But as somebody who is wretched at names, uh, I've also learned that sometimes I do much better admitting I don't remember their name than getting it wrong and feeling bad about that. So I, I think there's, a, you know, we all have our personal preferences. because you did say there were mistakes you haven't made. Yes. <laughs> yes. And listening to this podcast is definitely one of them. Like I said, you have an episode for everything. So it just, that that is one that I've, I've 
you know, I, I definitely Amanda McCoy's story time strategies is, was a huge one for me. I, I can tell you I changed some of the things I was doing in my story time after listening to that episode. Um, Kelly Hinks had some collaboration with teacher pieces. You know, I, it was just something I hadn't gotten to do in my former space in the way that I'm able to do it now. And so listening to her episode about ways to collaborate um, was very helpful. So I, that, that's a mistake I haven't made. Um, another one, but uh, I think it was Tammy Grewer or, or Heather Morfield Lang at, at UNCG always told me to have a list. Always have a list of books that you need purchasing or whatever it is that you want for that library. Have it ready to go. And let your principal know that if you ever need, if they ever have extra money that they just need to spend right away, you will always have something available. And that, you know, that is, that has done well for me. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm so grateful you're here because there are a lot of school librarians who are, who have joined us in this, in this journey and talking about the things that we have learned from because Looking back on the mistakes we've made, I, I got to be honest. I'm I'm old enough. I'm now a mentor to uh, to many people I work with because they are all uh, you know easily 25 years younger than I am, and um, I'm now this is year 30 in education. So I, I get to be that work mom. I get to be that that mentor, and and but it's okay because you know you get to impart some of those mistakes that you've made on the younger and upcoming teachers and, and be like, you know, I want you to learn from mistakes and I want you to be able to, to feel confident moving forward. You know, Jennifer, it is very early in 2023. Uh, I'm hoping you'll share with us what are some of the things that you are hoping to do in this upcoming year? You know, you are, you've, you've got uh, a couple more months of the school year and still plenty of time to do some wonderful things for your new school. Yes. So, well, I've mentioned the makerspace. So that is a big, uh, that's just working with teachers, collaborating, getting them in the makerspace, um, having fun with the kids there um, and just trying all sorts of new things. Uh, I, that That is definitely a piece of it. Um, we're going to have, we're celebrating World Read Aloud Day coming up. And so Christina Holtzweiss is going to be um zooming in and doing a makerspace activity with us, which is really awesome. So I am totally looking forward to that. I have also recently, this is kind of not within my school, but um, I I am now the book club coordinator for NC Slama. So um, they have created a, a book club and it is it is kind of amazing. We The first one we had Bar Bonnie Garmus with Lessons in Chemistry. Um, she was able to join us, and so she she spent a whole hour just answering questions. It was amazing. Um, so now I'm I'm kind of taking over that role um, and leading, and it, it's really just there to kind of you know allow librarians to do what we like to do, which is read. I also have a, a second book club with some of the teachers at my former school. We uh, a lot of us have have left the school, but we have continued our book club. We we started a staff book club several years ago, and that has just been so impactful because we choose books that will allow us to learn about the students and families that we teach. And it's just been pretty amazing discussions. Um, it's also a time to just, you know, you know, get together and we can vent and we can just, you know, laugh and cry together, but also, you know, do that learning piece. So I will continue that. Um, those are just some of the things that I have plans coming up. Jennifer Long, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for allowing us to share in this exercise that you have had of reflecting on, on how much growth you've experienced a, as a school librarian. Would you please let us know where we can find you on social media? Sure. I am on Twitter at Long for the Library, and that's Long and then the number four, the library. I don't do Instagram and I'm not much on Facebook, so, so that's kind of the only place on the right now that you're going to find me. Well, and friends, I'll also make sure, to, you know, in the show notes, you'll definitely want to take a look. We'll include Jennifer Long's school library website as well, so you can take a look and, and learn more about her program. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. You know, I'm very aware 
aware that when guests come forward and say, Hey, I'd like to be on the show, you know, you are always sort of stepping outside of your comfort zone. And I think that school librarians do that with quite a bit of regularity. And it, it really does speak to who we are as educators. But I'll tell you what, when somebody steps up and says, not only do I want to be on your show, but we're going to talk about the mistakes I've made, that really does demonstrate a willingness to grow and a willingness to, to exemplify that kind of, you know, sort of reflection that we should be doing to hopefully move forward and, and be better in, in our schools, uh, for our students and for our staff. I am so grateful to Jennifer that she made the decision to, to, to do this episode because I, I really think it gives all of us an opportunity to reflect on our own practice. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And sharing just a little bit more of the letter that Laura from Missouri sent to the podcast, Laura said, I met with a few area teacher librarians yesterday at a professional development and encouraged them to join our state organization, which is also wonderful, but to also listen to your podcast. One last friendly reminder, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be Greatest Hits, Middle School, and my conversation with Angela Myers. I hope you will tune in. 